is the message for the last days. You churches have played. You had your fun. And you thought you was going to get into heaven because you're baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And had the Holy Ghost speaking in tongue. And you go around bragging you born again and you save. You save? Let's talk about that. Save have a broader meaning than just baptism and Holy Ghost. You are saved to be saved. Let me repeat that again. You are saved to be saved. What do you mean? If I repent of my sins and go down in water in the name of Jesus Christ, which is what everybody got to do. Everybody in here that haven't been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, you're still a sinner. I don't care if you went to a preacher's church and held his hand and repeat a sinner's prayer. No such prayers in the Bible. Just leave that preacher hand alone and put your hand in your pocket. Right. You ain't never been saved since you came out of your mother's womb until you did it on Bible order. That's right. After you repent of your sins and be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus and receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost, which is the Holy Spirit, which is the presence of God or the power of God in man. That saved us from sin. But we can lose that salvation here. Wait a minute, Pastor Jesus, I thought once saved, always saved. Uh-huh. That's a lie. If that was true, I wouldn't be here. That's right. You mean to tell me, Pastor Jenny, once saved, always saved is not true? Your preacher lied to you. Lied to you. Let me show you in the Bible. Give me 2 Chronicles. 2 Chronicles chapter 15. I don't want you to take my word. If you watch the program, you know we build with Bible. That's right. My God, man, I stay in that Bible like a bird in the nest. That's right. Eh? That's right. All right, Will, let's, I want to work on the once saved, always saved, because undoubtedly I got some of you here <laughs> who thought you got saved 15 years ago. You helped the hand of some manicured nail preacher who had a Jerry Curl hairdo, <laughs> and you, you may was sincere. And he said, well, if there's anybody who desired to come to Christ, anyone who desired to come to Christ, and you came up, you know, crying with your eyelash coming detached and your <laughs> mascara all over your face, amen, and, and you helped some fella's hand, hmm. and you didn't know what he was. That's right. You didn't know whether he was an alcoholic, a drunk, a drug dealer, or a homosexual. You just held some fella's hand. That's right. Look how careless you were. And then he said, repeat after me. Lord Jesus. How many can identify with this that done this? Raise your hand. Don't be ashamed. Come on now. I want to help you out. Yeah, I know you are. <laughs> now, this is what they do. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. I'm a sinner. Wash me, cleanse me. White as snow. And then the preacher said, you saved my friend. You ain't no more saved than a duck can smoke a cigar. <laughs> you've been conned, you've been duped, you've been lied to. Think of it. A man going to tell you that you saved and got you doing something that Jesus didn't do? Think. When Jesus came to the river of Jordan, did he hold John the Baptist's hand and ask for Christ to come in his heart? Where do you get this man-made stuff from? It looked like salvation, but it ain't salvation. Like when I was a child in the 1970s, the old heads can bear witness, the two-door Cadillac El Dorado was long. So what a lot of guys did in the hood they took that grill off and put the Rolls Royce grill on it. So when the Eldorado come up the street, the kids be like, oh, that's a Rolls Royce. No, it ain't. It's a, just a Cadillac. It looked like it. Yeah. You've been conned. Yeah. That's why I preach so hard against false preachers. A lot of these fellows know they're lying to you, duking you, conning you. But they don't care as long as you keep shoveling out money. That's right. They don't care. That's right. You are no more saved at all. You've been a sinner all your life. Amen. You bow your head and raise your hands. You're not saved. Preacher told you join the church. You're not saved. Well, Pastor Dennis, I confess with my mouth and believe in my heart and I am saved. No, you ain't. 
Bible ain't say you are saved. No. The Bible said if thou shalt confess thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe that he rose from the dead, thou shalt be saved. That means you got some more to do. If, if, if you put money in the bank, thou shalt get interest. That's right. You got to put it in there first. Yeah. Am I right? Follow me in your Bible. Second Chronicles chapter 15. I want this to be good for you that was taught one save, always save. I'm going to debunk your pastor. <laughs> Amen. I'm going to debunk him. I don't care if your pastor here tonight, I'm going to debunk you, Bishop. Amen. Hmm. Listen. Second Chronicles 15, we're starting at verse 1. Follow me. And the Spirit of God came upon Azariah, the son of Oded. That's what's lacking today. Amen. Spirit of God ain't coming on these fellows today. No. Spirit of money come on them. <laughs> huh? Amen. Spirit of God came upon Azariah, the son of Oded, and he went out to meet Asa and said, Here, Hear ye me, Asa, and, and all Judah and Benjamin. What did he say? The Lord is with you. On what terms? While ye be with him. I want to show you this. This one save, always save, is just as a lie. A lie. Listen good. The Lord is with you while ye be with him. All right. And if ye seek him, if you seek him, he will be found of you. All right. But. What? But. But. If ye forsake him. Uh-oh. When you forsake something, you leave it, correct? Amen. The Lord say, if you forsake him, what he, will he do? He will forsake you. You leave the Lord, God leaving you. That's right. So one save, always save is an old classic lie. Oh, yeah. You save, playing the lottery. You save, drinking whiskey. You save, in the club. You save, smoking cigarettes. You save, two and three husbands. You save, live together, not married. You save, homosexual. Hmm. Amen. Amen. <laughs> What do homosexuality and Christ got in common? That's right. What? Nothing. What? Nothing. That's right. Thus saith. Thus saith the Lord. The Lord. Set thine house in order. One thing about the truth of God, this message is from God. Oh, yeah. Designed to get everybody house right if they simply obey it. That's it. My God, man, people was making their exodus out of, these, out of these churches all around the world, like, like the Church of Israel coming out of Egypt. Amen. Men, men is giving up their positions. Deacons is laying down their deaconship. Pastors is coming out of pulpits. Because when you stand before God, you ain't going to be able to tell God, I'm a bishop. He ain't impressed. No, no. That's right. He killed bishops. That's right. He killed elders. That's right. The Lord said, I killed. Mm. I make a life. That's right. I wound. I heal. Well, Pastor Jennings, I just don't think God would do that to me. I'm, I'm just too cute. <laughs> you was a cute liar. Amen. Worms waiting for you too, Miss Cutie. That's right. I don't care if you got more curves than Route 17 and 95 and 85. <laughs> Listen, I often say when that beautiful woman die, or the one that believes she's beautiful, the worms don't be in the ground arguing with each other. Here's a woman die, believes she's God's gift to man. And here's another one, folks think she look like homemade soap. The worms don't be down there. Hey, yo, Ralph, what's up? We got another body here. All of a sudden they go in the oh man, she fine. Oh man, we can't bother her. Hey, yo, Jimmy, what? There's some ugly bro right under. Let's go there. No. Oh, yeah. Beautiful woman. Beautiful woman. That mouth that another man's tongue was in mm. drops open in that coffin. That's right. Filled with roaches and worms and mice. That's right. Rats. Make a nest in your gut. My Lord. Gnaw on your bones. Yeah. Brother, that eye ah. that winked at that woman. Ah. Huh? Just winking. <laughs> Am I right, I said? Yeah. Those eyes fall out. Preach it, preach it, brother. Replaced with spiders, spiders and worms and all kind of insects. Yeah. Ain't as cute as you thought. 
Mm -hmm. And as handsome as you feel, they can put on you all the a, a tailor-made suit, which is one of the dumbest things that anyone can do. Why would you take a corpse, put a tailor-made suit on it, alligator shoes, custom-made shirt, custom-made cufflinks, and a tie just to dump it in dirt? That's right. That's right. Am I making sense? Yes, <laughs> I believe in doing that body the way they done Jesus. Because there ain't nobody better than Jesus. The Bible says in what was fulfilled, written of him, they wrapped him in fine linen and laid them in a sepulcher. Wrapped your body in linen, put you in a casket, and put you in the ground. 20, 30, 40, 50 thousand dollars for a casket? Think of it. Your children can use it. That's right. Amen. Amen. Thus saith the Lord. God willing, if I die, it ain't none of that stuff. No, no custom made coffin because we leave thousands. No, 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 no custom made coffin at all. Um, no, I'm not even in, I, not, not even in a suit. Nope. So wrap my body in linen from head to toe. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That's the rule. Yes, sir. Wrap my body from head to toe. Yes, not my clothes, not a shirt, nothing. Yes, wrap it from head to toe. Yes, Get a pine box yes, and drop it in the ground. Yes, and let the work of God go on. Yes, you are going to church, but you ain't making no preparations to meet God. That's where y'all made y'all mess. You go to church every week and you're not making no preparations to meet God. And the only way to make preparations to meet God is if you're taught the right thing. That's right. That's right. Because you go to church and jump and shout, I don't mean you're ready to meet God. I came up in the hood, you know, and sometimes we'll mix it up. And there was times that fellas wasn't ready to mix it up. They sell wolf tickets, though, out there talking, yeah, yeah, you come on, yeah, you come on. And then an old head would just come on out, walking, taking his time, strolling. He'd be like, Yo, you calling one of us out? He always <laughs> grinning because he know he can back up his goods. And that fellow wolf ticket, yeah, come on. Old head is like, all right, come on. Throw it your best. He's just as laid back. The young one just jumping around like bees. <laughs> Swinging all wild, old head just. <laughs> That's all you got? To that young fat swing wild, oh here sidestepping. Mm. Before you know it, huh. the young boy, he's out, gone. You're going to church, but you're not stopping and thinking. Is this teaching that I'm getting? Is it gonna get me in the first resurrection? That's it. Teaching does two things. Save you or damn you. Are you getting the sincerity of this? Teaching does two things. Save you or damn you. That's right. God letting you know he's closing in on you, brother and sister. Your body ain't the same. Your heartbeat have changed. Vision changed. Getting pains where you never had. That's right. Death anger's ready for you, but the Lord said, No, just hold up, hold up. Hold up, just wait. Wait. Go ahead. But you want me to wait for, Lord? I, I got to give him a hard time. But they doing what I want them to do, Lord. He's smoking, he's drinking, he's lying, she's dying her hair, she's out there living like a fool. Why you want to be so merciful, Lord? I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. That's right. That's right. You think you get to your 60s and 70s and 80s and 90s by luck? Mm. You think you reached those years by luck? No, sir. No, sir. It's an act of mercy right. and an extension of God's mercy yeah. just giving you time yeah. to run to him or if need be, crawl to him. Yeah. That's right. You're 65, 70, 75 years old. 
And instead of thanking God by repenting of your sins, being baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, besides being on your 65-year-old knees calling God for the Holy Ghost, you'd rather go out and party and get a drink. You'd rather go out and party with your old friends and smoke and lie. You'd rather go out to a club and look at some half-naked pervert with gold draws, shake his anatomy in your face. That's right. Instead of walk with God and woman, you rather go to a club and see some man come out of a cake yeah. and shake his anatomy in your face. Oh, yeah. Instead of walk with God, fella, you rather go to a club and look at a woman slide down a pole yeah. and you go home broke. Yeah. Am I right, I said? Yeah. Can't buy your children no milk. Can't buy your children no food. Can't even pay your mortgage. All a woman did was slid down the pole. Hmm. Walk down the aisle. Breast half hanging out. Backside showing. That's right. And you made it rain. <laughs> and you broke. Amen. Why well, use a club fool? That's right. That's right. Look at all the years you wasted. Look at all the years you played. And then when you die, a sinner posing as a preacher hmm. will lie to your family. Lie to your family. Well, well, Brother Brown is laying here. And uh, he put his preacher's voice on. And uh, Brother Brown. Mm, Brother Brown. Brother Brown, he... I saw him about to, he's about to breathe deep now. <laughs> about to go up there with his mother. <laughs> I see me. I see Brother Brown right now standing yeah. with his father. I mean, just stand there and lie. 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 And family sit there. Oh, praise him, Jesus. You know the way the old mothers do, they always rub them arms, you know. Oh, praise him. Brown is on his way to hell. Amen. Amen. Call a spade a spade. You don't preach to make people feel good. You don't preach so people can love you. I don't care who hate me. Long as I earn the love and the respect from God, that's it. Hallelujah, glory to God. That's it. That's it. That's it. I don't care if no one love me walking the earth. If I got the love of heaven, who can love me more than him? Who can love me stronger than him? Who can love me better than him? Not only that, with God. I never have to be tricked. And I will never be betrayed. That's right. The Bible says, God, hallelujah. God is faithful. Look at yourself, young man. Look at you. You go to church on Sunday. Big deal. Look at you. Still shoot pool. Still party. Some of you come here because a lot of you never saw the preacher in person that you see on television. And I know the message on television have hit you right in your heart. On television, you've been told about your wrong. On television, that message, you see, these preachers don't, they, they message like this. Stop your wrong, stop it. You better stop, boy. That's right. Holiness. That's why you get mad at me. That's right. You sit and watch the telecast. Preach it, man. And open up a can of beer. Preach it. You will drop that beer when you fear God. That's right. You lay there next to a man that you're married to the second time. Yeah. That's right. You lay you, you lay in there next to Melvin. Yeah. And you know Freddie's still living. Yeah. Your first husband. 
And when that word is preached, you look at Melvin. And Melvin look at you. He's talking about that adultery again. Turn them off, Melvin. Turn them off. Melvin, turn them off. You know, he was doing, I ain't giving you up. Really look at what we got. We got a house together. Huh? Huh? She don't even say we got a house together. We got a house together. <laughs> No, you, we got cars, and we got bank accounts, we got children. What, what, what you, he expect for me to leave you? Stay there and go to hell. Because yeah. that's what's going to happen. That's right. I didn't write the book. That's God right. said he hate divorce. Hate divorce. Right. And if God say he hate it, and your pastor promote it, your pastor is a sinner. Jesus. You bear in mind, nobody will make the first resurrection if the Lord come and find you in a second marriage that's right and your first wife and your first husband is still living Amen. you will never get into the kingdom of God at all at all you follow these flesh loving preachers go ahead because they pacify you in your sins Amen. and you go to some fake church on Sunday so you can feel like you're doing something then a choir started singing, going up yonder, and you said, oh, that moved me. <laughs> I felt something. Felt something. <laughs> it is common to feel emotional when someone sang. That's right. Someone can get up and sing the blues and make you cry. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Huh? Amen. Amen. Are you getting what I'm telling you? Amen. Somebody can sing the blues and make you cry. You can put on an old record of Billie Holiday, singing about strange fruit. And you'd be like, man, wow. <laughs> Better get myself together. Okay. It is common Hallelujah. for the body to be emotional when we are moved by a song. That's right. Just like it is common for men and women to rebel when they hear the word of God. That's right. Now you can hate this type of in your face preaching all you want. You're still going to die. Oh yeah. Thus, thus saith the Lord. Think of it. Amen. I don't care how cute and how handsome you think you are. One thing about God, He will end your marriage. Hmm. He ain't in your relationship. Yes, he will. He don't care how much you hug that man, hug that woman. When death come, God say, take him. That's right. That's right. Hmm. She's on the bus. Take her. That's right. She's in there cooking. Take her right now. Mm. Spatula fall. Frying pan hit the ground. He's on a job. Take him. He's a construction worker. He fall all the way down. He's already dead before he hit the bottom. He go in the operating room. Take the doctor who's performing surgery. Kill him. Kill him. Kill the doctor. I let the patient live. That's true. <laughs> That's true. Ah! Doctor just got started on your heart. Uh -huh. God said, you've been around long enough. I'm going to take you. I heal the heart and let her walk out. Mm. Hallelujah. You running around here like there is no God. Hiding behind some hypocrite and religion that you think is called Christianity. You ain't never served God since you've been born. Until you do it according to God's everlasting word. That's right. I can't help but preach like this because there's a woe behind me. Oh, yeah. Huh? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Amen. I was made a minister yeah. and was made by hands of heaven. That's right. Yeah. And a man under the sun going to preach like this unless God make him. That's right. You look at what's on social media or on television or radio now, these men justify every piece of trash. Out here, the Amen. way they got it, it's no sin being a sinner. Yeah. Who's talking? Give chapter and verse again. Still, Everybody all right? Yeah. Don't lie now. Amen. Still in Isaiah chapter 38 and at verse 1. All of you that are here, I don't care what church you go to, leave it. Leave it. Leave these churches down here. Leave them. Amen. They don't went cold. The so-called apostolics don't went cold. That's right. What happened? What, what, what makes them go cold? The Bible says, when iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax how? Oh. When sin take over church, the word of God becomes less. 
and less mm -hmm. and less and less. So what happened is now the preacher started justifying the sin yeah. because he's afraid to lose members. And things he used to preach against, people would be like, well, Bishop, Bishop, wait a minute. I thought, you know, I thought women was not supposed to preach. Well, you know, I see how the Lord is using my wife, so mm. and if my wife can do it, all of y'all can do it. That's, right. That's true. That's true. And this is what most bishops do. Before they die, they ain't looking at whether someone is qualified right. to lead That's the right. people. Right. Only thing they looking at, who's my flesh and blood. Right. So they groom son. They don't care if son is a baby maker. Mm. They don't care if he smoke weed. Right. They don't care if he drunk. They are going to groom that son to take over his business. That's right. His business is his church. Mm -hmm. He keep the money in the family. Mm -hmm. You in these churches play organs and drums and guitars and soloists and all this other stuff with no God. Amen. This is the last days. And in the last days, the message is warning oh, yeah. to the people, not fun for the people. That's right. They want to go to churches where they can have a Christian cruise where all the so-called saved women can walk around, save men in bikinis. Amen. Am I right? Amen. You got to be out your mind. What in the world was a Christian woman doing out in public with your behind hanging out, out, out. all your thighs showing, and your breasts hanging out no. to my you saved? Saved from what? That's right. If you had any morals and decency and still was a sinner, you don't come out in public like that. That's right. That's right. Church is sponsor cruises. Yeah. Men got on tight bathing suits yeah. and bare chested and bare legged, walking on the deck with the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> now that woman looking at you in all them tight shorts advertising your anatomy, she ain't thinking about Jesus. No. No more than you think about Jesus looking at her with all her goods manifest on deck. That's right. You know I'm telling the truth. When I came up, I was told the church is a light to the world. Church ain't no light to no world. World's a light to the church. You don't believe me? When the world came out with rapping, who doing it now? So-called church people. The rap came out with videos uh, just dim, uh, looking at our young women on these rap videos, yeah. just showing themselves. Yeah. So-called Christians doing it now. That's right. Aren't they? Amen. The music of the rapper and the music of the church, the same, even church now, you see them, somebody coming in. All right, come on, put your hands together. Come on, come on. Put your hand, and this was the church people. Church folks. That's true. And he's a rapper. What shall we say then? Shall we continue to sin? That's that true. grace may abound. God forbid. How shall we live the day at the sin? Live as long as they're in. No, you not. So many of us was a ba 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 baptized in Jesus. No, 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 no. Hallelujah. Am I right, man? Amen. Talk to me. Now, that's true. What happened is this. If you've been raised in a dirty house, being filthy is normal to you. And when you go to somebody's house that's clean, you're going to look at them like, wait a minute, what? Something wrong. So, if you've been misled for years, where church play has been going on for years, it seemed abnormal to you when someone speak against the criminal activity that you've been indulging in. That's right. That's right. When I came up, the old mothers of the church, man, if you was a young sister, mm. your dress or skirt too short, if you was on the front row, that old mother either did two things, snatch you off of it, or threw a sheet or something over your legs. That's right. But now grandma, Grandma got her mini skirt up, swish it. <laughs> Grandma!
Cameron got her ankle chain on. That's right. You didn't even wear an ankle chain when you was 19. Why would you wait till you get to your 60s and 70s and 80s and wear the label of a prostitute? Go ahead. What's the matter with you? Amen. Amen. You're the grandmother. You should be getting the ankle chains off your daughters. That's right. That's right. Am I right? Amen. You see why they hate Pastor Jennings? Thus said the Lord. Set thine house in order. Get your house right. Amen. Folks is praying, oh Lord, please mm. make America better. America ain't going to get better because your house is in a mess. Oh, wow. If you take a home that have discipline, a father and a mother who believe in raising their children with morals and ethics, yeah. teaching them self-respect, yes sir, yes ma'am, and you children, get this in your head. <laughs> you under your parents' roof, you can't come in the house when you want to. No. You want to come in when you want, get out and get your own. That's right. Let me just tell you straight up, you can't get your own, shut up and come in when they say. That's true. You don't like it, that's your business. Amen. Now think of it. That's true. If kids lose respect for father and mother, you're going to see that child, that son, jumped up in father's face. Yeah. Who you talking to? That's right. Get out of my face, old man. Why? He no longer have regard or respect or fear. She gonna roll her eyes at her mother. Oh, when her mother talked to her, she gonna start walking. And the mother gotta say, do you hear me talking to you? Now, see, when I came up, <laughs> yeah, when I came up, you couldn't even disrespect your parents in your dreams. <laughs> You know, because somehow or another, they got in your dreams and whipped your tail. But look how society has gotten so backward. All right, years ago, if your child got wrong, your neighbor corrected. Today, your neighbor child can get wrong, and your neighbors don't want you to correct it. Because if you correct it, you may end up dead. That's right. Now, how can you correct your children if you in a mess? Amen. You can't reprimand your children from cussing and you cuss them out. You're going to lay your son out for coming in drunk and yet the first shot of beer was in your refrigerator. That's right. He learned how to cuss from his daddy. Your daughters shop around from boy to boy, from boy to boy, because mama got more men than ticks on a dog in her own house. Right. Am I right? That's right. That's right. Amen. Your daughters dress like prostitutes. Yeah. Because the mama out wow. there with a dress short as my jacket. That's right. With a split in that. Yeah. And here she is, the daughter, 10 years old, with something laced all up her thighs, lipstick on, earrings, rouge on her face, with a pocketbook looking like she's about 25. And here's the mama telling a 15-year-old daughter, my baby is growing up. Yeah. Do not... Prostitute. Let's read this. In the book of because Leviticus. A lot of folks say, you know what, Pastor Jennings, you know, I love your preaching, but sometimes your mouth is just too raw <laughs> and you shouldn't say some things. Amen. All right, let's get some Bible. In Leviticus chapter 19 and at verse 29. 1929. That's the year to stop market crash. Very good scripture. <laughs> That's right. Remember that. Think of it. Hmm. 1929. 1929. Leviticus. Mm -hmm. All right, follow me. You mothers, follow me. Do not prostitute thy daughter. You old mothers may as well stop trying to be young. Face the fact. Yeah. You're a senior citizen. Act like it. That's right. Get them dresses down. Amen. Stop exposing your body. Go ahead. And you men Go ahead. that's up in age yeah. and your wife is up in age with you, will you mind telling me why you so comfortable that your wife is out here half naked? Go ahead. 
Why you ain't got no shame that your wife advertised her breasts Go ahead. to the neighborhood yeah. like she's Mr. Rogers? <laughs> and you want to fight everybody. Fight yourself. Amen. Grandma, you out here with ankle chains. Grandma, you out here with fake hair. Grandma, you out here with splits. Grandma, you out here sitting one leg east and one leg west. Yeah. Grandma, you out here smoking. You out here drunk walking down the street. Hey, 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 get out the way, girl. Get that car. Go around me. Ain't no one out there. That's right. <laughs> Go ahead, man. Go ahead. This is common sense preaching. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We get older and don't get better. Mm -hmm. We drink so much, it changes the complexion of our skin, the color of our eyes, the pigmentation of your lips. You become slaves to liquor bottles. That's right. Slaves to cigarettes. Liquor become your plantation, and tobacco become your master. Amen. Whether you black, white, brown, yellow, or red. Yeah. You a Christian? Why you got a bar in your house? Oh, yeah. It ain't no Christian Jack Daniels. <laughs> you see, you, you, God sent me in the last days with this message to let the world know your going to church don't prove nothing to him. Yeah. Your going to church don't prove nothing. Your going to church ain't doing nothing unless you come back to the Bible. That's it. Come on back to Bible. That's right. Come on back to Bible. Amen. You might as well get ready to come on back to Bible. You might as well get ready to do it. That slick haired reverend can say anything he want over you when you die. Mm -hmm. No preacher got the last say over you. God got the last oh, say over you. That's right. That's right. Listen at this. In Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 29. Do not prostitute thy daughter. Look at what the type of clothes you buy your daughter. Mm. You let her boyfriend spend the night over your house. Yeah. And your mama didn't even let you do that. That's right. You let all these makeup kits in the house and all these different color hairs. And, mm -hmm. and the parents are so backward now. If the son say, uh, Mama, Dad, I want to talk to you. You know what? <laughs> I'm in love. And his name, mm. this is your son. son. Mm. This is your son. That's right. His, his, his name is Paul. Can I bring Paul over to the house? Yes, bring Paul over. Paul, when Paul come over. <laughs> Go ahead, brother. Am I right, man? Yeah. Talk to me. Yeah. Now, <laughs> and your mama and your daddy will agree with it and say, Congratulations. What's wrong with you? My Lord, no. You have wobbled in dirt so long. Until you call dirt clean and you call clean dirty. Yeah. Until now you say, to each his own. God said. That's right. That's right. God said. Yeah. I made the woman yeah. for the man. Yeah. Did he say so? Yeah. What happened to your manhood, brother? God said, I made the man yeah. in my image. Yeah. And if we are made in God's image, yeah. what is so feminine about God? That's right. That's right. God ain't feminine. No. Listen, the Bible said God have his way in the whirlwind. That whirlwind come tearing up everything. You don't see a whirlwind coming. <laughs> When they give it, when they, when they give it, they knock down the house. <laughs> Am I right, I say? Yeah. 
Go ahead, brother. What happened to you? What happened to you? What happened? What happened to your manhood? Yeah. Where's your guts, woman? Mm. That you will settle for your son marrying another boy. Mm. They can't produce no grandbaby. Go ahead. Talk to me. And you said to eat your zone. They ain't no, this has got to do with God. Amen. You have became so corrupt oh, yeah. and so weak and wallow in trash yeah. and religious filth and so long. So long. Now church is flying rainbow flags. And yeah. you criticize the Catholics? Mm. Apostolics doing it too. Apostolics doing it, Methodists doing it, Christian Science doing it, Baptist, Presbyterian, Lutheran, Pentecostal. That's right. Men with men. Men with men. Men with men. Actors that are cross dressers sell their manhood so they can make $20 million from a movie. That's right. My dignity is more valuable than money. Amen. Amen. When I speak out against Tyler Perry and Ricky Smiley, mm. they say he's rich. Who cares? Who cares? Thus save the Lord. The Lord. Set thy house in Set order. Thine house in order. For thou shalt die and not live. You let God care you while you got those let female God clothes on. That's right. A real man ain't no cross dresser. No. Not a real man. Ain't no Christian dressing like a man and dressing like a woman. No. Imagine me coming here, my wife dressed hat and pocketbook and pumps. We're going to bring before you our brother, our leader, and our teacher, and our guide, our brother, Pastor Gino Jennings. And I just come up. One Lord, one faith, <laughs> one baptism. One. They just look at me like I lost my mind. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's all right, I say. That's right. You young men, yeah. what's wrong with you? You can't make up your mind whether you're a boy. Make up your mind. You don't know whether you're a boy? Go in the mirror and stand buck naked. Go ahead. <laughs> Hallelujah. Am I right, I say? Yeah. If you got a roll ball, go in front of the mirror and flash. Flash. You a boy! Go ahead, brother. Go ahead, man. Go ahead. I'm gonna make it so raw, you raw. got to understand. Churches is telling you it's all right. Politicians is telling you it's all right. Mayor is telling you it's all right. Governor is telling you it's all right. Children cartoons is telling you it's all right. God is still saying, no! Amen. So how can a man represent God and say yes when God said no? If God say no, I will die saying no. That's right. Go ahead. Well, Pastor Jenner, you sound like you don't love him. Oh, I love the person, but I hate the deed. That's right. If you got a son struck out on drugs, do you love your son? You love your son, don't you? But you don't love his deeds? That's right. That's right. You don't like when he's stealing your chickens? Huh. And they dead? Amen. Stealing your frozen chicken? Yeah. Stealing your soap? Stealing your toilet paper? <laughs> you love your son! That's right. But his deeds is wrong! That's it. That's, right. That's it. That's right. Amen. Amen. Mm. So you fake churchgoers Go ahead, brother. who just carry the Bible. Don't you know the Bible is called a sword? Oh, yeah. Amen. How is it you ain't never cut? Hmm. Amen. 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 What kind of sword never. your preacher using? Huh. When I came up, my mama bought me a toy sword. I was out there like three months of tears. <laughs> and when it will break, we'll get branches. Constantly going at it. That's right. 
These preachers ain't using the Bible now. No. They messages from a laptop. Yeah. They message they written out all week. Now. That's right. That's right. And then give it a title. Mary had a little lamb. <laughs> and you sit there. Go ahead, preacher. Go ahead. Go ahead. Listen to them talking. They, say, they just sitting there. Look at them talking about Mary. Look at them talking about Mary. Call you a nursery rhyme. Then the preacher make a sucker out of you. Take you back to kindergarten. Yes, he will. And then tell you over the television. You're not looking up your own television. Get a piece of paper and trace your hand. <laughs> trace your hand. Trace your hands. He actually take you right back to arts and crafts. And you fall for it. That's right. Trace your hand. Trace your hand. My neighbor, my neighbor, my neighbor, my neighbor, my neighbor, my neighbor. Oh, you can sell it. My neighbor, trace your hand. Trace your hand. And you sitting there. Uh, Bill, you got some paper? I want to trace my hand. Look at you, look at you, look at me now. Trace your hand, trace your hand, trace your hand. And the Lord said, the Lord said, what, what, what did you say, Lord? What did you say, Lord? Halala, shakalala, Peter, pack a pick a pepper. <laughs> after you trace your hand, then cut it out. Cut, cut it, it out. out. You know, it don't have to be perfect, just cut it out. And after you cut it out, you mail that cut out paper with to me, and I would lay my hand on it, and we would touch and agree. Touch and agree. Sucker. <laughs> That's right. He was a sucker. Amen. How many here is from the hood? Raise your hand. Don't you know a hustle when you see one? Hustle. Some of these preachers are the worst hustlers on it. That's why they're trying to get me off the air. Do you know preachers have reached out to the FCC to ban me off of television all around the world? (laughs) They don't want want this message on the television. I'm like a pit bull. That's why the preachers are licking you. You a sinner. (laughs) You a sinner. You're, you're a good sinner. We come along. <laughs> Sink the word of God right into you and rip that man britches that got that second wife and send him running down the street. Amen. Amen. You might as well come on back to the Bible. That's right. That's you're going right. to die one day. Father, husband, brother, wife, sister, daughter, grandma. You're going to die. No sweet words a preacher say about you is going to get you in the kingdom of God. Even if you say you're a Christian, it ain't worth two cents. Because ain't nobody like Christ unless they do it on God's terms. That's right. Give chapter and verse again. Isaiah chapter 38 and at verse 1. I'm warning you. Thus saith the Lord. Glory to God. Glory to God. Amen. Thus saith the Lord. Set thine house in order. That's That's why we're here in Port Smith. Yeah. I want to warn the entire city, all the Tidewater area. Everybody in Tidewater area and around the world. That's right. All of you. Mm -hmm. Black, white, brown, yellow, green, purple. (laughs) You're going to meet God. Hate me all you want. I don't care. You're still going to meet God. Oh, yeah. Huh? Oh, yes. You fellows that got wives, you're supposed to be the head of your house. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Here, the word may be burning your wife up. Come on, honey, leave, leave, leave. I'm ready to go. <laughs> Weak man be like, all right, wait a minute, wait a minute. You know, I don't want anybody to look at us. Look, I don't like what he's saying. I ain't, I ain't, I don't look like no prostitute because I got my ankle chain on. You bought it. That's right. <laughs> Hallelujah. You don't look holy at all. You're going to die one day. You're going to be a stiff, Amen. cold slab. And those lips that he used to massage with his mouth, Go ahead. it's going to be stitched closed. Mm-hmm. Those eyes that used to wink, mm-hmm. you may die with them open. That's right. That's right. But you're going to be pushed into darkness. Oh, yeah. He's going to separate your spirit from your body and your spirit. According to Ecclesiastes, go back to God. Oh, God. And your body goes to dust. That's right. They can give you a so-called Christian celebration home going. Hmm. Let the all the choir sing. Gone up yonder. Hmm. God is not impressed. No. Everybody under the sun must repent of your sins. Repent. Everybody. Everybody. Be baptized in water. Everybody. Everybody. In the name of Jesus Christ. That's right. If you ain't baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, you're not saved, never been saved, still a sinner. Yeah. And that don't mean get baptized, and then after you're baptized, you go back to your false church. You still go to hell with the baptism. That's right. Because the Bible says, come out from among them and be separate. Mm-hmm. You young men, 
It's time to get off the streets of Virginia. You out here living like a fool with your pants hanging down, advertising your underwear. For what? Got your pants no higher than your, your bottom of your backside, and then you put a belt on. Where's the logic? Amen. <laughs> Fathers are like this, sons like this, grandfather like this. Amen. You can see them in churches, choir rehearsal, look like a bunch of hoodlums. Street That's true. thugs. That's true. In church, bare chested. Amen. In church. Amen. Amen. No standard. Mm -hmm. And these liars say, God ain't looking at your hour. God just look at the heart. Oh, yeah? Mm -hmm. If God ain't looking at your outward as well as the heart, why did God tell the man in the 11th chapter of 1 Corinthians, it's shame for a man to have long hair? Hair is outward. Your heart don't have hair. That's right. Isaiah told Hezekiah, now let's think of it now. Isaiah. Nobody in here is a king. Hezekiah was a king. That shows you God ain't got no respect to person. No. <laughs> all right, now let's look at all of this quickly. Still in Isaiah chapter 38 and at verse 1. In those days was Hezekiah sick. Check, 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 brother Williams, Mike. All right, come on, son. In those days was Hezekiah sick unto death. All right. And I unto him uh -huh. and said unto him thus saith the Lord what set thine house in order this is for you are you going to obey this mm -hmm. or are you going to leave out and continue in your false church and continue in your sins right. time to set your house in order for thou and shalt it, die. Mm -hmm. it begins tonight yes, sir. Right. because some of you may not make it back tomorrow and some of you may not even make it to your doorstep That's true. but you heard this message That's right. You, you heard this message. Get mad if you please. It don't mean nothing. Don't mean nothing. You heard this message. Amen. Human family. You heard this message. That's right. Preachers. That's telling folks you can divorce and you can remarry and all this stuff. There ain't nothing wrong with being a homosexual and God ain't looking at your hour. He gets looking at you. you. Talk all your foolish talk all you want. You all white churches and all black churches that think only white folk going to be in him. <laughs> and only black folk going to be in him. That's right. One thing about heaven that ain't going to be segregated. No. And you know one thing? I never saw not one, not one. I never heard of one prejudiced death angel. No. <laughs> no. Death angel don't come out of a white man when a black man walks by and says, oh, 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 I'm sorry. <laughs> Knock off the black man. No. White man become pale. Black man become gray and ashy. Yeah. The death angel is hitting now while I'm talking. That's right. Or it take God, the only time he's going to retire is when the Lord put him at a hope. Amen. Until then, he got a mission that will take place up until the coming of the Lord. That's right. What are you going to do about it? Are you going to remain proud and arrogant? and self-willed and thank you somebody because you got a few thousand dollars in a bank account. You got your house paid off. Why you think like a fool? You, when you die, you ain't got no money. money. You ain't got no house. You ain't got no car. Nothing. Nothing. So why you think you got so much now? Will you please get it in your brain? Because one day your brain will stop. Yeah. And the doctor will cut open your cranium. Mm. Get a saw. Open your skull up. And you will lay there. Mm. Can't do nothing. Right. You got the, op the greatest, listen, this is the greatest opportunity since you've been born. Yes. Amen. Yes. Amen. To get right with God. That's right. Well, Pastor Jennings, I wasn't raised with that religion. Your religion ain't worth nothing. I'm trying to get you to pick up what God say. That's right. It ain't Pastor Jennings' religion. It's what God say. Amen. And God Almighty demands for you to be holy. 
That's right. What did he say? Thus saith the Lord. Thus saith the Lord. Set thine house in order. All right. For thou shalt die and not live. All right, what happened? Then Hezekiah turned his face toward the wall. Glory to God. That message, that message stirred up Hezekiah. Yeah. He didn't go to the Lord. Well, wait a minute, Lord, I'm a king. What you talking about? Hmm. I rule kingdoms. Yeah. The kings of kings spoke here. That's right. He's bigger than Hezekiah. Oh, yeah. uh -huh. Then Hezekiah turned his face toward the wall and prayed unto the Lord. Uh oh, I want all of y'all to pay attention. He prayed to the Lord. And said, remember now, O Lord, I beseech thee. Look at him. Going before God in humility. Yeah. Remember, Lord, I beseech you. How I have walked before thee in truth. Can you say that? Mm. Truth. Hallelujah. If you, want, if you want an extension, can you say that? Mm. Now you see what I'm talking? Amen. If you want an extension and want God to have mercy on you, can you say that? Remember now, oh Lord, you I got a second you. wife and your first wife still living. You can't say that. No. You baptized Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. You can't say that. No. You are Baptist, a Methodist, a Presbyterian, a Lutheran, a non-denominational. Claim you some apostolic. You can't say that. No. Because the only way you can say you walk before Him in truth is when you walk before him according to scripture that's right whatever's in scripture that's truth not what your pastor said that's what right. god said yeah. that's right. am i right yeah. amen i want to prepare you to meet god that's it that's my assignment prepare men and women to meet the lord that's it what he said and said remember now O lord i beseech thee what is it how i have walked before thee in truth and and with a perfect heart and a complete heart and have done that which is good in thy sight. No, I've done that which is good in the sight of my wife. And have done that which is good in thy sight. In the sight of my husband. Good in thy sight. And in, in the sight of bishop. In thy sight. You see, let me get this to everybody that's here and everyone that's watching. Oh. I've been saying this moreover. Your loyalty must be towards God more than any organization in the world. That's right. Your loyalty towards God must exceed your loyalty to some church. Amen. I don't care if you hold a position. You mean to tell me you're scared to lose your position and you see your bishop lying to you? Mm. Oh, Pastor Jennings, you know, he ordained me. So what? <laughs> That's right. We're talking about life or death. Or death. The Amen. Bible said, choose ye this day. Amen. Whom you going to serve? Oh, yeah. If God be God. Serve him. serve him. If Baal be God, serve him. Amen. We are determined yes, not to become what churches have become. That's right. Amen. <laughs> mm -mm. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Amen. If a minister get up and preach something contrary to the Bible, I'm on, I'm on him. I mean, I, I'm on him with the nightstick of the scriptures. And if he can't accept correction, you're fired. I don't care how much of us in the spirit you are. If you up here preaching and you just don't stop jerking. Lord said, Lord said, yeah. Mm -hmm. When you done, where did the Lord say that at? Where did the Lord say that at? I want answer. I don't want no tongues. Yeah. <laughs> not, not the size of a gnat's ankle will we tolerate deviation. From God's word. Amen. Your soul is the most precious thing you have. If you lose that, you lost everything. Amen. Are you listening to what I'm telling you? Listen. And have done that which is good in thy sight. Uh -huh. And Hezekiah wept sore. Oh. Notice he didn't go before God arrogant, no. proud, no. high-minded. No, no. This man humbled himself. He was a king at that. But he humbled himself. Yes, when you humble yourself, you ain't looking at the kind of car you drive. No? Huh? You ain't too humble where you can't get on your knees. I got a Versace. Versace would be in hell along with anything else. I don't care if you got a Versace or a Houdini. But I care nothing about your name brand folly. I, I'm, I'm laboring to get people back to God. That's right. They mindset got to get the mindset of the old school. That's right. Huh? Mindset got to come on to the old school. So you get these young folk. Well, this is the way I see it. Who 
cares about the way you see something? God say my thought is not your thought, neither is my way your way. Amen. Amen. Do you hear this? And Hezekiah wept sore. Then came the word of the Lord to Isaiah saying, After he prayed, after he cried and pleaded out to God, because God let him know, you're going to die. Right, not live. Get yourself right. Mm -hmm. Anything you're dealing with, get that right. That's right. And let it function under my guidelines and my law. That's it. <coughs> after he cried to the Lord. Then came the word of the Lord to Isaiah. The Lord came back and talked to Isaiah again. Saying, go and say to Hezekiah. What? Thus said the Lord, the God of David, thy father. Uh -huh. I have heard thy prayer. Hey. Hmm. If you're wrong tonight, do you want God to hear your prayer? Your prayer. If you know that if you die tonight, you are lost soul, would you not want God to give you a chance to get right? Wouldn't you? Amen. Glory to God. What did he say? I have heard thy prayer. I have heard your prayer. I have seen thy tears. I have seen your tears. Behold. Look, I will add unto thy days 15 years. I give you another chance. Hallelujah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God is giving the world chance after chance Hallelujah. after chance. Yeah. Some of us sitting here have been shot, but you're still living. Shot again. Still living. Stabbed. Still living. OD'd. Still living. Drunk. And was in car accidents. Still living. That's right. Was in the operating room and had a flat liner. Boop. Still living. That's true. That's right. You made God promises. If you deliver me, I do this. God knew you wouldn't. But he had mercy on you anyway. Right. And you went right back out there bang, gang banging again. That's right. Amen. God, is, God is more good to you than you are to yourself. Amen. Am I right, I said? Amen. Having this knowledge, why is it you find it so difficult to give your life to him? Listen, brother, you think it demean your manhood to bow to your Lord? To the Lord. Do you know God can make you bow? That's right. You walk around, I hear what you're saying, Pastor Jenny, but you ain't gonna never get me down no floor doing some praying. Lord, my Lord. The Lord say, I can't. All of a sudden, he run a pain through your heart, down your leg, down your arm, and take your breath. Not only are you on your knees, you're flat on your face. That's true. That's right. You ain't your own. You better get it in your head. You young, middle-aged, and old, you're going to die. You're going to be ushered in the morgue. Your body will be picked up by somebody. You will be rolled in some church. If you have not repented of your wickedness, what you mean, if you never were sorry and asked God to forgive you for your evil. Yeah. And be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, which is the commandment of God. And come out of these false churches. Mm. You will suffer a penalty for being arrogant, self-righteous in your religion and burn in an everlasting hell. That's right. That's right. If anybody want to get right with God, I want to take advantage of the chance. Like Hezekiah did. If you want to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ and walk with the message of holiness... And be right with God. Stand on your feet. If you want to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, stand on your feet. Come on, stand on your feet. Yeah. 
If you want to get it right with God, stand on your feet. Come on. Come on. Glory to God. You that are standing. You see that? You see that brother and sister, them signs over there say baptism? All of you go over there. All of you that are standing, go over there. Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. One gospel.
Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters in Christ, I would like to thank God for allowing us to come together, even from different corners of the world, to delve into His Word. Thank God for sending a leader like Pastor Gino Jennings. It is a blessing to witness how technology can bridge the physical divide and unite us in our pursuit of spiritual growth and understanding. I want to personally thank each one of you for tuning in and devoting your time and attention to this study. Your eagerness to learn and explore the depths of Scripture is truly inspiring. I hope and pray that you have found value in today's discussion, that it has touched your heart, and that you have gained insights that will shape your faith journey. Remember, the Bible is an endless wellspring of wisdom, and as we continue our virtual gatherings, my earnest desire is that we continue to learn together, grow together, and be transformed by the timeless truths it holds. I encourage you to keep seeking the truths of God's Word and to apply them in your daily lives, allowing them to shape your thoughts, words, and actions. I want to extend an open invitation to subscribe for Bible studies, biblical news, sermons, and more. Together, we will embark on a new chapter, exploring new passages and delving deeper into the mysteries of God's plan for our life. Let us continue to build a community where we can support and uplift one another in our spiritual journeys. Once again, I am truly grateful for your presence and participation. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you, guiding you, and bringing you peace. Take care, and may God bless each and every one of you abundantly. Good morning, brothers and sisters in Christ. Today, I want to talk to you about the importance of repentance in our Christian walk. Repentance is not just a one-time event that happens when we first come to Christ but it is a continual process of turning away from sin and turning towards God. The Bible teaches us that repentance is necessary for salvation. In Acts 2, 38, Peter said to the crowd, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. We cannot receive forgiveness of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit without first repenting of our sins and turning towards God. Repentance involves a change of heart, a change of mind, and a change of direction. It means acknowledging our sinfulness and turning away from our sinful ways. In 2 Corinthians 7, 10, Paul writes, Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret, but worldly sorrow brings death. Repentance is not just feeling sorry for our sins, but it is a genuine sorrow that leads us to turn away from sin and towards God. Repentance is also a key component of sanctification, the process of becoming more like Christ. In Romans 12, 2, Paul writes, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Repentance is a part of renewing our minds and transforming our hearts to be more like Christ. It is important to remember that repentance is not just for the unsaved. Even as Christians, we still struggle with sin and we must continually repent and turn towards God. In Revelation 2, 5, Jesus says to the church in Ephesus, Remember the height from which you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. We must constantly evaluate our lives and turn away from sin, returning to our first love for Christ. In conclusion, repentance is an essential part of our Christian walk. It is necessary for salvation, sanctification, spiritual growth, and maturity. It involves a change of heart, mind, and direction, turning away from sin and towards God. As we continue to walk with Christ, let us continually examine our hearts, confess our sins, and turn towards God in repentance. May we strive to live a life that is pleasing to God and brings glory to His name. Amen. Heavenly Father, as I bow before your divine presence, I am filled with awe and reverence for your infinite majesty and boundless love. 
You are the Alpha and Omega, the creator of the heavens and earth, and the sustainer of all life. I come before you with a heart overflowing with gratitude for the countless blessings you have bestowed upon me. Thank you, Almighty God, for the gift of life itself, the breath that fills my lungs, the beating of my heart, and the intricate complexity of my body. Your divine design is a marvel beyond comprehension, and I am in awe of your craftsmanship. In Psalm it is written, I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful, I know that full well. I acknowledge your marvelous handiwork within me. Lord, I am grateful for the abundance that surrounds me, the roof over my head, the food on my table, and the warmth of clothing. In a world filled with uncertainties, you have been my steadfast provider, meeting my needs according to your riches and glory. I praise you for your faithfulness, as proclaimed in Lamentations, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I thank you, O God, for the relationships you have woven into the fabric of my life, for family, friends, mentors, and even the strangers who have offered kindness. Each person is a reflection of your love, and I am grateful for the companionship, encouragement, and support they provide. Your word in Ecclesiastes reminds us of the value of companionship. Two are better than one. If they fall, one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him who is alone when he falls and has not another to lift him up. Gracious Father, I acknowledge that life's journey is not without its challenges. I thank you for the lessons learned through trials, the growth fostered amidst difficulties, and the resilience cultivated in times of adversity. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love Him, who have been called according to His purpose. I trust in your divine plan even when circumstances seem uncertain. Lord Jesus, I am grateful for your sacrificial love demonstrated on the cross. Your grace and mercy are my constant companions, and your redeeming love is the anchor of my soul. Thank you for the forgiveness of sins and the opportunity for a renewed life in, in Ephesians. It is proclaimed, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. In moments of stillness and reflection, I am humbled by the beauty of your creation. The majesty of mountains, the serenity of oceans, the splendor of sunsets, and the wonder of starlight skies, each element of nature whispers of your glory and testifies to your sovereignty. Your word in Psalm declares, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Father, I lift up to you the aspirations of my heart, the dreams, ambitions, and desires that rest in the depths of my soul. Grant me wisdom, discernment, and guidance as I navigate the paths ahead. For promise in Proverbs assures me, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways submit to Him, and He will make your paths straight. With sign I pray for the world around me, for peace in places torn by conflict, for healing in areas ravaged by disease, and for hope in communities grappling with despair. May your light shine brightly amidst the darkness, and may your love be a beacon of hope to those in despair. As I reflect on the past, I recognize moments where I fell short of your glory. Forgive me, Lord, for the times I strayed from your path, for the words spoken in haste, for the thoughts harbored in anger, and for the actions devoid of love. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me, as articulated in pray for a spirit of gratitude to permeate every facet of my life, a gratitude that transcends circumstances, recognizing your hand at work in both joys and trials. May thankfulness be the melody that echoes in my heart and spills forth in my words and actions. In moments of decision-making, grant me clarity and discernment. May your word be a lamp to my feet and a light to my path, illuminating the way forward. Your promise in James reassures me, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. Father, I pray for a heart that is quick to forgive, that mirrors your abundant mercy and grace. Help me extend compassion to those who have wronged me, as I have been forgiven by your boundless love. Your word in Colossians instructs us, bear with each other, and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. I lift up to you the seeds of kindness and love sown into my life. May I, in turn, be an instrument of your love, compassion, and grace to those around me. In your command in John resonates deeply, a new command I give you. 
Love one another, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. As I look toward the future, I place my hopes, dreams, and uncertainties into your capable hands. I surrender my will to yours, trusting that your plans are good and your purposes are perfect. In Jeremiah you declare, For I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Heavenly Father, I am in awe of your goodness, overwhelmed by your love, and grateful for the privilege of approaching your throne in prayer. As I conclude this extensive prayer, I do so with a heart surrendered to your will, a spirit receptive to your guidance, and a soul anchored in the hope found in Christ Jesus. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, I pray. Amen. Beloved congregation, today, as we gather in the house of the Lord, let us open our hearts and minds to the presence of God's everlasting love. Our journey of faith is a remarkable one, filled with joy, challenges, and opportunities for growth. In the midst of life's complexities, we find solace in the comforting embrace of our Creator, who walks alongside us every step of the way. In this sermon, I wish to reflect upon the profound truth of God's unconditional love and its transformative power in our lives. Love is at the very core of our faith, binding us together as a community and guiding us in our interactions with the world. It is through love that we find healing, reconciliation, and purpose. The scriptures remind us time and again of the immense love God has for us. In John 3:16, we read, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. These words echo through the ages, reminding us that we are cherished beyond measure. God's love is not restricted to a select few, but extends to all, encompassing every individual, regardless of our flaws, shortcomings, or past mistakes. Yet, we often struggle to fully comprehend the depth of this love. We may feel unworthy or burdened by guilt, allowing it to overshadow God's grace. But let me assure you today that God's love is unconditional and knows no bounds. It surpasses human understanding, encompassing both our triumphs and failures, drawing us closer even in our moments of weakness. Imagine a love that is steadfast, unwavering, and ever-present. A love that reaches out to the lost, the broken, and the marginalized. This is the love that God offers us, inviting us to accept it with open arms, it is through this love that we experience transformation and find the strength to extend love to others. The Apostle Paul, in his letter to the Corinthians, beautifully articulates the qualities of love. He writes, Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. 1 Corinthians 13, 4, 7. These words paint a vivid picture of the love that should guide our lives. It is a love that goes beyond mere sentimentality or fleeting emotions. It is a love that compels us to action, to extend a helping hand to those in need, to speak up for justice, and to embody compassion in our daily interactions. Brothers and sisters, as we reflect upon God's love, we must also recognize our responsibility to love one another. Jesus, in his ministry on earth, exemplified this love through his words and action. He welcomed the outcast, healed the sick, and forgave the sinner. He taught us that the greatest commandments are to love God with all our heart, soul, and mind, and to love our neighbors as ourselves. Matthew 22 37, 30, 9. In a world often characterized by division, hatred, and strife, we, as followers of Christ, are called to be agents of love and reconciliation. We are called to bridge the gaps that separate us, to embrace diversity, and to build communities grounded in love, acceptance, and understanding. Let us not underestimate the power of love. It has the ability to heal wounds, mend broken relationships, and restore hope where it has been lost. Love has the power to transform lives, communities, and nations. It has the power to bring light into darkness and to turn despair into joy. 
But love requires intentionality. It requires us to be intentional in our words, our actions, and our attitudes. Love calls us to look beyond our own needs and desires, to empathize with the struggles of others, and to extend grace and forgiveness. As we go forth from this place, let us carry the message of God's love within our hearts. Let us be bearers of hope, peace, and reconciliation in a world that so desperately needs it. Let us be known by our love, reflecting the image of our loving Creator. May the love of God guide us, the grace of Jesus sustain us, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit strengthen us on this incredible journey of faith. Amen. Beloved Congregation, Today, as we gather in the house of the Lord, let us open our hearts and minds to the presence of God's everlasting love. Our journey of faith is a remarkable one, filled with joy, challenges, and opportunities for growth. In the midst of life's complexities, we find solace in the comforting embrace of our Creator, who walks alongside us every step of the way. In this sermon, I wish to reflect upon the profound truth of God's unconditional love and its transformative power in our lives. Love is at the very core of our faith, binding us together as a community and guiding us in our interactions with the world. It is through love that we find healing, reconciliation, and purpose. The scriptures remind us time and again of the immense love God has for us. In John 3, 16, we read, For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. These words echo through the ages, reminding us that we are cherished beyond measure. God's love is not restricted to a select few, but extends to all encompassing every individual, regardless of our flaws, shortcomings, or past mistakes. Yet, we often struggle to fully comprehend the depth of this love. We may feel unworthy or burdened by guilt, allowing it to overshadow God's grace. But let me assure you today that God's love is unconditional and knows no bounds. It surpasses human understanding, encompassing both our triumphs and failures, drawing us closer even in our moments of weakness. Imagine a love that is steadfast, unwavering, and ever-present. A love that reaches out to the lost, the broken, and the marginalized. This is the love that God offers us, inviting us to accept it with open arms. It is through this love that we experience transformation and find the strength to extend love to others. The Apostle Paul, in his letter to the Corinthians, beautifully articulates the qualities of love he writes, Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. 1 Corinthians 13, 4, 7. These words paint a vivid picture of the love that should guide our lives. It is a love that goes beyond mere sentimentality or fleeting emotions. It is a love that compels us to action, to extend a helping hand to those in need, to speak up for justice, and to embody compassion in our daily interactions. Brothers and sisters, as we reflect upon God's love, we must also recognize our responsibility to love one another. Jesus, in His ministry on earth, exemplified this love through His words and actions. He welcomed the outcast, healed the sick, and forgave the sinner. He taught us that the greatest commandments are to love God with all our heart, soul, and mind, and to love our neighbors as ourselves. Matthew 22, 37, 39. In a world often characterized by division, hatred, and strife, we, as followers of Christ, are called to be agents of love and reconciliation. We are called to bridge the gaps that separate us, to embrace diversity, and to build communities grounded in love, acceptance, and understanding. Let us not underestimate the power of love. It has the ability to heal wounds, mend broken relationships, and restore hope where it has been lost. Love has the power to transform lives, communities, and nations. It has the power to bring light into darkness and to turn despair into joy. But love requires intentionality. It requires us to be intentional in our words, our actions, and our attitudes. 
Love calls us to look beyond our own needs and desires, to empathize with the struggles of others, and to extend grace and forgiveness. As we go forth from this place, let us carry the message of God's love within our hearts. Let us be bearers of hope, peace, and reconciliation in a world that so desperately needs it. Let us be known by our love, reflecting the image of our loving Creator. May the love of God guide us, the grace of Jesus sustain us, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit strengthen us on this incredible journey of faith. Amen. Beloved congregation, today I stand before you to share a message of hope, faith, and resilience. In the midst of our world's challenges, it is essential that we anchor ourselves in the unwavering truths of our faith. The journey of life is often filled with ups and downs, joys and sorrows, victories and defeats. But through it all, we are called to hold fast to our belief in a loving and sovereign God who walks with us in every season. As we look around, we cannot deny the many trials that surround us. We witness the pain of loss, the turmoil of conflicts, and the ever-present uncertainties that grip our hearts. It is during these times that our faith is tested and we may find ourselves questioning God's presence and purpose. But let me remind you today that even in the darkest of moments, God's light shines through. In the book of Psalms, we find solace in the words of King David, who experienced his fair share of trials and tribulations. In Psalm 23, he declares, The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. Psalm 23, 1. 3. These verses remind us that God is our constant companion, guiding and providing for us even in the most challenging time. In our journey of faith, we encounter seasons of drought and seasons of abundance. We experience mountaintop moments and valley experiences. But through it all, we must remember that God is faithful. He is present in our joys, celebrating with us, and He is present in our sorrows, comforting and healing our brokenness. When we face trials, it is easy to become disheartened and lose sight of the bigger picture. We may question God's plans and wonder why He allows suffering in our lives. But as the prophet Isaiah reminds us, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. Isaiah 55. Isaiah 55. 8. 9. In our limited understanding, we cannot comprehend the intricate tapestry that God weaves. He sees the beginning from the end and understands the purposes behind every circumstance we face. Our role is to trust in His wisdom, surrendering our plans and desires to His perfect will. Moreover, as followers of Christ, we are not alone in our struggles. Jesus himself walked the path of suffering and faced tremendous challenges. He experienced rejection, betrayal, and the weight of the world's sin upon his shoulder. Yet through it all, he never wavered in his trust in the Father. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus fervently prayed, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. Luke 22. 42. This profound act of surrender exemplifies the depth of trust and obedience that Jesus demonstrated. It is an example for us to follow when we encounter trials in our own lives. Through our faith in Christ, we have the assurance of victory. Jesus overcame death and the grave, and He offers us eternal life. This knowledge gives us hope in the midst of despair, strength in times of weakness, and peace in the midst of chaos. As the Apostle Paul writes, if God is for us, who can be against us? Romans 8, 31. Beloved congregation, I encourage you today to hold on to your faith, no matter the circumstances. Trust in God's promises and embrace His love that never fails. Let us seek His guidance in every decision, His comfort in every sorrow, and His strength in every weakness. Our journey may be long and filled with challenges, but we can face them with confidence, knowing that God is with us every step of the way. As we leave this sanctuary today, let us be beacons of hope in a world that desperately needs it. Let our lives reflect the love and compassion of our Savior. May we extend a helping hand to the hurting, a listening ear to the lonely, and a message of salvation to those who have yet to experience the love of Christ. Remember, dear congregation, that our faith is not stagnant but alive and active. 
Let us walk in faith, trusting that God will guide us, provide for us, and equip us for every task He sets before us. May our lives be a testimony of His goodness and grace. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May His face shine upon you and give you peace. Amen. What does the Bible say about women's roles? Let's take a look at a few Bible verses that tell the roles and character a woman should have according to God. Proverbs 31, 10 to 31. Who can find a virtuous woman? For her price is far above rubies. The heart of her husband doth safely trust in her so that he shall have no need of spoil. She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. She seeketh wool and flax and worketh willingly with her hands. She is like the merchant's ships. She bringeth her food from afar. She riseth also while it is yet night, and giveth meat to her household, and a portion to her maidens. She considereth a field, and buyeth it. With the fruit of her hand she planted the vineyard. She girdeth her loins with strength, and strengtheneth her arms. She perceiveth that her merchandise is good. Her candle goeth not out by night. She layeth her hands to the spindle, and her hands hold the distaff. She stretcheth out her hand to the poor. Yeah, she reacheth forth her hands to the needy. She is not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her household are clothed with scarlet. She maketh herself coverings of tapestry. Her clothing is silk and purple. Her husband is known in the gates, when he sitteth among the elders of the land. She maketh fine linen and selleth it. Strength and honor are her clothing, and she shall rejoice in time to come. She openeth her mouth with wisdom, and in her tongue is the law of kindness. She looketh well to the ways of her household, and eateth not the bread of idleness. Her children arise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praiseth her. Many daughters have done virtuously, but thou excellest them all. Favor is deceitful, and beauty is vain. But a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands, and let her own works praise her in the gates. 1 Timothy 2, 9-15 In like manner also, that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair, or gold, or pearls, or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing, if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. Genesis 3, 16. Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over the thee. 1 Corinthians 11, 3. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. Luke 8, 1-3. And it came to pass afterward that he went throughout every city and village, preaching and shewing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God. And the twelve were with him, and certain women, which had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, out of whom went seven devils, and Joanna, the wife of Chusa Herod's steward, and Susanna, and many others, which ministered unto him of their substance. Genesis 2 And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. Ephesians 5, 22-33 Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands, as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church, and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, 
of his flesh and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. Luke 10, 38-42 Now it came to pass, as they went, that he entered into a certain village. And a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was cumbered about much serving, and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her therefore that she help me. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things, but one thing is needful. And Mary hath chosen that good part which shall not be taken away from her. Titus 2, 3-5 The aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. 1 Corinthians 11, 2-16 Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the ordinances as I delivered them to you. But I would have, you know, that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonoreth his head. But every woman that prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncovered dishonoreth her head. For that is even all one, as if she were shaven. For if the woman be not covered, let her also be shorn. But if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her be covered. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head, for as much as he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of the man. For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. For this cause ought the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. Nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman, neither the woman without the man, in the Lord. For as the woman is of the man, even so is the man also by the woman. But all things of God, judge in yourselves. Is it comely that woman pray unto God uncovered? Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him? But if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given her for a covering. But if any man seem to be contentious, we have no such custom, neither the churches of God. Acts 18, 26. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, who, when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him unto them and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. 1 Corinthians 14, 33-35. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, today we gather to explore a topic that has intrigued and, at times, frightened many believers throughout history, the mark of the beast. As we delve into this subject, let us approach it with open hearts and minds, seeking wisdom from God's Word and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Today, we will explore the significance of the mark of the beast, its implications for believers, and how we can navigate these uncertain times with discernment and faith. Understanding the mark of the beast. The mark of the beast is a phrase mentioned in the book of Revelation specifically in Revelation 13, verse 16, 18 to 18. It symbolizes allegiance to the Antichrist and his system of deception and control. While the specifics of this mark remain a topic of interpretation and debate, we can discern its essence as a sign of loyalty to a worldly power that stands in opposition to God's kingdom. The Spiritual Battle To understand the mark of the beast, we must recognize that it is rooted in a spiritual battle between God and the forces of evil. Ephesians 6 verse 12 reminds us, 
For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. As believers, we are called to be vigilant and discerning, recognizing the deception that seeks to draw us away from God's truth, the danger of deception. The mark of the beast represents a powerful tool of deception employed by the enemy. Revelation 13 verse 14 describes how this mark will deceive many, causing them to worship the Antichrist and pledge their allegiance to his counterfeit kingdom. We must be aware that deception can take many forms, from false ideologies to distorted teachings and enticing promises of power and security. Therefore, we must remain rooted in the unchanging truth of God's word, seeking discernment and wisdom from the Holy Spirit, remaining faithful, in the face of the mark of the beast and the allure of deception, our faithfulness to God becomes paramount. Revelation 14 verse 12 encourages us, This calls for patient endurance on the part of the people of God who keep His commands and remain faithful to Jesus. Our commitment to God's commands and our unwavering allegiance to Jesus are our greatest safeguards against being led astray. It is through prayer diligent study of Scripture and reliance on the Holy Spirit that we cultivate a steadfast faith that withstands the trials of this world. Discerning the Times As followers of Christ, we are called to discern the signs of the times. Jesus himself urged his disciples to be watchful and discerning of the signs of his second coming. Matthew 24 verse 30 2 to 30 5. While we do not know the exact details of the mark of the beast, we can be certain that it represents a broader spiritual battle between good and evil. As we navigate these times, let us cultivate a spirit of discernment, being aware of the world's influence and comparing everything with the truth of God's Word. The ultimate victory. Though the mark of the beast may instill fear and uncertainty, let us remember that our hope lies in the ultimate victory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Revelation 20 verse 4 assures us, and I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony about Jesus and because of the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. This verse reminds us that our allegiance to Christ and our unwavering devotion to his truth will bring us through any trial or tribulation. Conclusion Beloved Congregation The mark of the beast is a symbol of the spiritual battle we face as followers of Christ. While we may not fully understand its details, we can equip ourselves with discernment, faith, and an unwavering commitment to God's truth. Let us not be consumed by fear, but rather be rooted in the hope and victory we have in Jesus Christ. As we navigate these uncertain times, may we remain faithful, discerning, and steadfast in our devotion to the Lord. In Him, we find the strength and wisdom to stand firm against deception and to bear witness to the truth of the gospel. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, our Savior and Redeemer, as we await His glorious return. In His name, we pray. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, today I stand before you with a heavy burden on my heart. The topic I wish to address is one that has been a subject of much speculation, fear, and confusion. The mark of the beast as followers of Jesus, it is our responsibility to seek the truth and discern the signs of the times. In this sermon, we will explore the details surrounding the mark of the beast, its implications, and how we can stand firm in our faith amidst these challenging times. Understanding the book of Revelation? Before we dive into the specifics, it is crucial to establish a proper framework for interpreting the book of Revelation. We must remember that Revelation is a highly symbolic and prophetic book, often employing imagery and metaphors to convey its message. Therefore, we should approach the text with humility, seeking the guidance of the Holy Spirit and relying on the broader teachings of Scripture for understanding. Unveiling the Mark The Origin and Nature of the Mark The book of Revelation speaks of a mark placed on the right hand or forehead without which people cannot buy or sell. Revelation 13 verse 16 to 17, 17. While there have been various interpretations of this mark throughout history, it is essential to differentiate between what is speculative and what aligns with biblical truth. Symbolism and Spiritual Significance 
It is crucial to recognize that the mark is not merely physical, but carries profound spiritual implications. Scripture often uses physical manifestations to represent deeper spiritual realities. The mark represents allegiance and submission to the Antichrist, a counterfeit of the seal of God upon the faithful. Revelation 7 verse 3. It symbolizes the rejection of God and the embrace of a godless world system. The dangers and implications of the mark. Spiritual consequences. Those who willingly accept the mark sever their connection with God, choosing to worship and serve the Antichrist instead. This decision has eternal consequences as it aligns one's heart and allegiance with the powers of darkness, leading to separation from God's presence forever. Economic and social implications. The Marxist association with buying and selling suggests a system of economic control and manipulation. In the last days, the Antichrist will establish a global order that requires submission to his authority, which will be enforced through economic restrictions. This poses a significant challenge for believers who refuse to compromise their faith, standing firm in face of the beast, cultivating discernment, in times of great deception, we must be grounded in the truth of God's Word. This calls for an unwavering commitment to studying and understanding Scripture, allowing the Holy Spirit to guide our interpretation and discernment. We should be vigilant, testing everything against the teachings of Christ, living out our faith. Our response to the mark of the beast should be rooted in our love for God and our unwavering faith in Jesus Christ. We must be prepared to face persecution, rejection, and even martyrdom, standing firm in our commitment to Christ and refusing to compromise our integrity. Dear brothers and sisters, the mark of the beast is an ominous sign of the approaching end times. While the specifics of its manifestation may remain uncertain, our focus should not solely be on deciphering its exact form, but on cultivating a deep relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ. We must be spiritually attuned, studying God's Word and discerning the times we live in. Let us commit ourselves to live boldly for Christ, rejecting the ways of the world, and remaining faithful even in the face of adversity. May we find solace and strength in the hope that Jesus Christ has overcome the world. John 16 verse 30 Knowing that our ultimate victory lies in Him. As we navigate these uncertain times, let us remember the words of the Apostle John. Little children, you are from God and have overcome them, for he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. 1 John 4 verse 4 Our faith in Jesus Christ empowers us to withstand the trials and tribulations that may come our way. Therefore, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Hebrews 12 verse 2 May we find comfort in his promises and draw strength from the fellowship of believers. Together, let us stand firm against the deceptions of the evil one, holding fast to the truth and righteousness found in Christ alone. In conclusion, dear brothers and sisters, the mark of the beast is a sobering topic that requires careful study and discernment. While we must be aware of the signs of the times, let us not be consumed by fear or speculation. Instead, let us focus on deepening our relationship with God, cultivating discernment, and living out our faith with unwavering conviction. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all as we navigate the challenges of these last days. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, today I want to explore a topic that lies at the very core of our existence, purpose. Each one of us longs to discover our purpose, to understand the reason behind our existence. In this sermon, we will embark on a journey to unravel the meaning of life and discover how we can embrace and fulfill our divine purpose. The quest for purpose. The human desire for meaning. From the earliest moments of our lives, we yearn to find purpose and significance. We question our existence, seeking answers to the age-old question. Why am I here? This quest for purpose is deeply ingrained within us, a reflection of the divine imprint placed upon our hearts. The illusion of worldly pursuits. Society often offers us counterfeit purposes, enticing us with the pursuit of wealth, fame, and power. However, we soon realize that these pursuits leave us empty and unfulfilled. 
True purpose lies beyond the temporal and superficial, requiring us to seek higher meaning. Discovering our divine purpose, created with intention. Scripture teaches us that we are fearfully and wonderfully made by a loving and intentional Creator. Psalm 139 verse 14 Our existence is not a mere accident but a deliberate design, with each of us uniquely fashioned for a specific purpose. Seeking God's will To discover our purpose, we must turn to the one who knows us intimately, the Lord our God. Through prayer, meditation, and study of His Word, we align ourselves with His will and invite Him to reveal His purpose for our lives. As we draw near to God, He guides us along the path He has prepared for us. Embracing our divine purpose, the ultimate purpose. Our primary purpose in life is to glorify God and enjoy a relationship with Him. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 31, Psalm 73 verse 25 to 26, by honoring God in all aspects of our lives, we find fulfillment and joy that surpasses any earthly pursuit. Uniquely equipped for service, God has bestowed upon each of us unique gifts, talents, and abilities. These are not to be squandered or used for selfish gain, but rather to serve others and build up the body of Christ. 1 Peter 4 verse 10, Ephesians 4 verse 12 verse 12. When we operate in our God-given strengths, we contribute to the fulfillment of our purpose. Navigating challenges and obstacles. Perseverance in the face of trials. The pursuit of purpose is not without its challenges. We may encounter setbacks, failures, and hardships along the way. However, these trials can refine our character, deepen our dependence on God, and ultimately shape us into vessels fit for His purpose, trusting in God's sovereignty. In moments of confusion or uncertainty, we must trust in the sovereignty of God. His plans for our lives are perfect, and He works all things together for our good. Romans 8 verse 20. 8. Even when we cannot see the full picture, we can rest assured that God is orchestrating every detail according to His divine purpose. Dear brothers and sisters, the quest for purpose is a journey that spans a lifetime. It is not a destination to be reached, but a continual exploration of God's will for our lives. As followers of Christ, let us surrender our own ambitions and seek to align our desires with His. May we find fulfillment, joy, and deep satisfaction as we embrace and fulfill our divine purpose, bringing glory to God and impacting the world around us. In closing, let us remember the words of the Apostle Paul, who said, For we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Ephesians 2 verse 10. We are not accidents or random beings. We are purposefully created by love and God. May we seek His guidance, trust in His providence, and faithfully pursue the purpose He has ordained for each of us. May the Holy Spirit empower us to live with intentionality, compassion, and perseverance as we navigate the challenges and joys of fulfilling our divine purpose. And may our lives be a testament to the transformative power of God's love, drawing others to seek their own purpose in Him. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all as we walk the path of purpose and fulfill our God, given destiny. Amen. Today's preaching from Christian pulpits is filled with compromise, often because of the wrong presentation of biblical love. Since love is a powerful, motivating force that can drive people to the limits of their abilities in existence, it needs to be defined correctly in the church, lest believers fall into grave error regarding our teaching and ethical standard. John 3.16 says, God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son. This illustrates the power of divine love. In this video, I will attempt to demonstrate why love does not define God, but God defines love. The contemporary world frequently reduces love to an erotic feeling between humans concerning selfish sexual fulfillment. This raw, erotic, transactional sexual experience between two people does not remotely resemble the biblical definition of love. Also, a feeling-centered understanding of love whereby people connect emotionally, liking each other as friends, limits our understanding of this powerful word love. 
The Apostle John says God is love in 1 John 4 8. Unfortunately, many interpret this verse to mean that God has no standards except an emotional feeling of love, compassion, and empathy toward the plight of others. However, our subjective, feeling-centered understanding of the word does not fully comport with the biblical understanding of love. There's a reason why scripture says God is love and not love is God. This is because God is the one who frames and defines love, derived from the character and holiness of his divine nature. Consequently, we cannot separate one attribute of God, for instance love, from other significant attributes of God, such as righteousness and justice, which are the foundation of his throne, according to Psalm 89.14. Justice and judgment are the habitation of thy throne. Mercy and truth shall go before thy face. Love without holiness and righteousness has no real foundation. Conversely, without the framework of God's character, love in and of itself is not anchored by any standard and is only defined by subjective, mercurial human feelings, personal desires, and opinions. What is the New Testament definition of love? The Apostle Paul defines love as actions, not mere sentiments in 1 Corinthians 13. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. What does the Old Testament law have to do with love? everything. In Exodus 20, God gave Moses a template in the Old Testament that defined love in the Ten Commandments. Each commandment depicted love in action toward God or our neighbor. How do we know these commandments were about love? When questioned about the greatest commandment, Jesus said to love God fervently with heart, soul, and mind. He concluded later by stating that all the law and the prophets hung on two commandments— loving God fervently, and loving one's neighbor. The Apostle Paul summarized the Ten Commandments by writing James, chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. Love is the fulfillment of the law. If ye fulfill the royal law according to the Scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. But if ye have respect to persons, ye commit sin, and are convinced of the law as transgressors. And in Romans 13, 8. The Apostle James also connected love and the law of God when he wrote in his letter, Owe no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. Unfortunately, some contemporary pastors ignore the law in their preaching, making it seem like Jesus inaugurated a new era of love like 1960-era hippies and negated the Old Testament moral law. However, Jesus clarified in Matthew 5.17 that he did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Jesus further stated in John 14.15 that the proof of someone loving him was that they obeyed his commandments. If ye love me, keep my commandments. Jesus also said in John 14, Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Thus, when we tell people that Jesus loves them just as they are, we also need to say to them that he expects them to repent, change their thinking, and to bring forth fruit that proves their repentance. John the Baptist connected a lifestyle change, a.k.a fruit as proof of repentance, and so did Paul the Apostle. Acts 26, 20, But shewed first unto them of Damascus, and at Jerusalem, and throughout all the coasts of Judea, and then to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God, and do works meet for repentance. Romans 6, 21, What fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. Of course, 
We are not saved by works, but through faith, according to Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. The first step is evangelism to promote an encounter with Jesus, the forgiveness of sins, and being born from above before we can expect people to change their lifestyle habits. It is impossible to serve God without the Spirit of God and Jesus living in us and through us. Galatians 2.20 I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. However, the Spirit of God enables Christ's followers to uphold the law, not negate it. Romans 3.30 1. Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid? As a result, the proof that a person is truly saved is through their works, which will be demonstrated over time, not by merely repeating a prayer for forgiveness. James 2.17 Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone? Indeed, the grace of God has appeared to empower believers to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions so we can be zealous to do good works. Titus 3, 8 This is a faithful saying, and these things I will, that thou affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men. Titus chapter 2 verses 11 through 14 For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that, denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. So, when pastors tell their congregation to disconnect from the Old Testament and to focus only on grace and the love of God without framing it concomitantly with his holiness, righteousness, and justice, they fall into the heresy of antinomianism. This gives people a license to sin, which Scripture condemns. Romans Chapter 6, verse 1 and 2, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin, that grace may abound? God forbid? How shall we, that are dead to sin, live any longer therein? Jude 4, For there are certain men crept in unawares, who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Antinomianism is a word in Greek which means anti, against, law. A doctrine that teaches Christians are freed from obeying God's moral law due to the grace of Christ revealed in the gospel. The antinomians regarded the necessity of obedience as legalistic, May the church define love through the character and holiness of God and no longer by the standards and definitions of the world. In so doing, may the church begin to experience a move away from the heresy of antinomianism and hypergrace and preach the whole counsel of God like Paul did. Acts 20, 27 For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Gracious and loving Father, we humbly come before you, acknowledging your presence in our lives. We are grateful for this opportunity to seek your wisdom and guidance as we reflect on the words of the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 16, verse 7. Your word reminds us that I do not want to see you now and make only a passing visit. I hope to spend some time with you if the Lord permits. Oh Lord, as we meditate on these words, we recognize the profound truth they hold. You are not a God who rushes past us, but a God who desires to spend time with us, to commune with us, and to guide us along our journey. We are reminded of the precious gift of time and the importance of investing it in relationships, especially with you, our Heavenly Father. 
Lord, we confess that in our fast-paced world, we often find ourselves consumed by busyness and distractions. We can easily lose sight of what truly matters in life, forgetting to allocate time for fellowship with you and nurturing our relationship with you and nurturing our relationship with you. Forgive us, Father, for neglecting the moments of quiet solitude with you, for filling our days with endless activities that leave little room for spiritual nourishment. Today, we pray for the wisdom to embrace the invitation you extend to us in 1 Corinthians 16. Help us to make intentional choices to spend quality time with you, not just in fleeting moments, but in deep and meaningful communion. Teach us to prioritize our relationship with you above all else, recognizing that in your presence lies our strength, our peace, and our joy. Lord, we also ask for your guidance in our relationships with others. May we be mindful of the importance of spending time with our loved ones, family and friends, family and friends. Grant us the wisdom to cultivate healthy and meaningful connections, to invest in the lives of those around us, and to be present with open hearts, listening ears, and compassionate spirit. Help us to see the opportunities for fellowship that you place before us and to seize them with love and grace. Father, we pray for your divine guidance and provision in our lives. Help us to discern the moments when we need to slow down, to step away from the chaos, and to find solace in your presence. Strengthen our faith, Lord, and grant us the endurance to persevere through trials, knowing that you are always by our side, ready to spend time with us if we seek you. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for the reminder found in 1 Corinthians 16:7. May it resonate within our hearts and inspire us to make intentional choices to spend time with you and with those whom you have placed in our lives. We surrender our schedules, our plans, and our desires to you, trusting that as we prioritize you and invest in relationships, you will lead us on a path of fulfillment, joy, and everlasting love. We come before you today, humbled by your infinite grace and overflowing love. We stand in awe of your wisdom your power, and your everlasting presence in our lives. As we gather together, we seek your guidance and strength, knowing that you are the source of all comfort and hope. Lord, we are reminded of the words written by the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 16 verse 7, For I do not want to see you now and make only a passing visit. I hope to spend some time with you if the Lord permits these words speak to the deep desire for fellowship and connection, and they resonate within our hearts as we gather here today. Father, we lift up our hearts and souls to you, asking that you grant us the opportunity to spend precious time in your presence. Help us to discern your will, to align our desires with yours, and to walk in step with your divine plan for our lives. Just as Paul longed to spend time with the Corinthians, may we too experience the richness of genuine fellowship, both with you and with one another. Lord, we recognize that time is a precious gift and it is easy for us to become consumed by the busyness and distractions of this world. We often find ourselves rushing from one task to another, neglecting the importance of spending quality time with you and with our loved one. So, we ask for your forgiveness for the times we have failed to prioritize what truly matters. Father, as we reflect on 1 Corinthians 16, <laughs> we pray for divine appointments and divine connections. Open doors for us, Lord, that we may share the gospel, extend a helping hand to those in need, and be a beacon of your love in this world. Give us the discernment to recognize the opportunities you place before us and the courage to step out in faith. We also lift up those who are feeling lonely and isolated. May your spirit comfort them and remind them of your unending presence. Help us as a community of believers, to reach out and embrace those who feel disconnected, extending a hand of friendship and love. Lord, we pray for our families, our friends, and our neighbors. May our relationships be deepened, strengthened, and enriched as we invest time and effort into building meaningful connections. Show us how to prioritize our time wisely, carving out moments to listen, to share, and to grow together in unity and love. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of time and the opportunities it presents. Help us to use it wisely, to cherish each moment, and to invest in what truly matters. May our lives be a reflection of your love and grace, and may our time be spent in ways that honor and glorify you. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.